4. Scary and Weird Mysteries from Florida Florida is probably best known for Disney World, retirement homes, and the Everglades. But despite the bright sunshine and beaches it boasts, it's also dubbed as the land of the weird and bizarre. The four cases on this list showcase the Sunshine State's odd side. These are four scary and weird mysteries from Florida. Number four, flat tire murders. In 1975 in Miami-Dade County, Florida, at least five people were brutally killed. The victims were all women and mostly in their 20s, but there were also two teens. They were 14-year-old Barbara Schreiber and Belinda Zetterower. The other three were 27-year-old Ronnie Gorlin, Elise Knapp, who was 21, and 23-year-old Barbara Stevens. Barbara was the first victim who was killed inside her home in Palmetto in February of 1975. The two teens who were classmates were killed on Cutler Bay in June of that year, and Elise and Ronnie were murdered in July. Detectives first noticed the connection between the Knapp and Gorlin case. The last three cases were only connected in 2011 when a medical examiner found the connection to the same killer. Detectives theorized that the killer had stalked his victims and for the majority of them punctured their car tires and approached them pretending to offer assistance. What's strange with this case is the fact that there are other similar cases of missing women all around the country running from Florida to California. All of the women inexplicably disappeared. Some of them were seen with an unidentified male helping them on the side of the road. In most cases, their vehicles would be found later abandoned with a flat tire. It's unclear whether the Florida flat tire killer was the same person going around the country in the 70s killing women and punching holes, but it could be a likely possibility. After all, the Florida killer was never arrested and those cases remain open even today. Police say that even though there were only five victims in the Sunshine State, the killer could have traveled and killed as many as 30 women. This murderer is regarded as highly intelligent and with a good amount of strength to overpower these women. The murders combined both shooting and stabbings. Blunt force trauma using hammer blows were also found with some victims. In fact, many of the women suffered such severe blows to their faces that they continue to remain unidentified. Number 3. Little Miss Lake Panasofsky It was February 19, 1971, when two hitchhikers were walking along a highway overpass in Lake Panasofsky, Florida. That's when they looked down and noticed a partially submerged body of a woman floating underneath the overpass. Police retrieved the corpse and began their bid to identify the victim. The female was fully clothed in green plaid pants, a green shirt, and green floral poncho. They also found a white gold watch, gold necklace, and a gold ring on her finger, a sign she may have been married. A man-sized 36 belt was fastened around her neck, indicating she most likely was killed via strangulation. During the initial forensic examination, they concluded the woman had been dead for 30 days before being discovered. Although they tried, because of this, the investigation came to a dead end and the case went cold. It wasn't until February of 1986, 15 years later, when the woman's body, now dubbed as Little Miss Lake Panasofsky, was exhumed to be examined again. This time, forensics uncovered more details about her life. It's believed she was 17 to 24 years old, had brown hair with prominent cheekbones and stood to be 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 5 inches tall. Her mouth had signs of extensive dental work, including silver tooth fillings and a porcelain crown. They also found out she was not only married, but had had at least two children and may have been of European descent. At the time of her death, one of her ribs was fractured, indicating the killer may have knelt on her while strangling her to death. Despite these new findings, investigators still weren't close to knowing who she was, and the case went to sleep yet again. With advances in technology in 2012, she was then exhumed again. This time, investigators were sure she was European and even narrowed it down to a possible location around Athens, Greece. When forensics tested her hair, it was discovered she was new to Florida, likely living there less than two months before she died. At the same time, facial reconstruction of the victim was released 
and the case was featured on a Greek missing person show. One viewer called in saying the missing woman and the reconstruction looked like a friend of hers named Constantina. She said Constantina and her went to school together in a small suburb of Athens. She told investigators that both of them, along with some of the other girls, were part of a school program that would send them to Australia or the United States to work as domestic help for two years. The caller said she lost contact with Constantina in 1970 when she was sent to Australia for the program while Constantina was sent to the U.S. Despite having a possible identity, however, no further information has surfaced whether Constantina is indeed Little Miss Panasofsky. However, Constantina still remains missing to this day, and even more jarring, the killer also remains unidentified. Number 2. Sarasota Mummy On August 7, 1959, Betty Steffens came running out of her home and into the street, screaming at the top of her lungs, It's Chan, it's Chan, he's been murdered. A romance made for the movies, Betty Thompson and Chandler Steffens were high school sweethearts. Betty was the daughter of a wealthy celery baron, while Chandler was a football hero who also hailed from a wealthy family. In Betty's sophomore and Chandler's junior year, they decided to elope to Brunswick, Georgia. Once Chandler graduated, they settled into Cincinnati so the newly married couple could go to Ohio University. They eventually had children, a son named Michael and a daughter Patrice. Parenthood and studying became problematic, however, and Chandler dropped out after three years, but eventually gave schooling another try when they settled back down in Florida. It was around this time that the couple's relationship began deteriorating. Betty was resentful of how Chandler treated her like a homemaker, and he also began staying out at night without telling her where he was going. On June 1st, she returned to Sarasota and moved back into her parents' house with her children. Chandler stayed in Gainesville to finish schooling, and on July 15th, Betty filed papers seeking a divorce citing extreme cruelty. While the couple admitted to seeing others during their break, the day Chandler finished his exams, he drove the three hours to Sarasota to win Betty back. According to Betty's father, it was a happy reunion. The two buried their grievances and decided to give their relationship one more try. Now, During his visit in Sarasota, Chandler stayed at 934 Yale Court, a rental property owned by his stepmother. His first night there, he woke up and found his sofa on fire. He tried to kill the flames himself but couldn't do it, so he called the fire brigade and explained to them that he had no idea how it started. On August 6th, the following day, Chandler and Betty headed out for some shopping and then had dinner with Betty's parents. Afterwards, they met friends at a popular hangout. By 10 p.m., Chandler was tired and wanted to go home to sleep since the fire the night before had kept him awake. That night, nobody truly knows how the events unfolded. After promising to call Betty the next morning but failing to do so, Betty dropped by Yale Court to see Chandler instead. It was here the young woman discovered his body and ran into the street screaming. She was so hysterical she had to be sedated. Chandler was officially dead from three stab wounds, one in the abdomen, another on the right shoulder, and another between his sixth and seventh rib. Then the killer slashed his throat from ear to ear. But this wasn't the most shocking thing. The coroner estimated Chandler died between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., which would have been shortly after he got home. There were no defensive wounds on him, so he was either caught off guard or immobilized while he slept. No easy feat when dealing with a former football hero. The killer also used a stolen first aid kit from Lido Casino Beach Club, which went missing from the club a day before Chandler arrived in Sarasota. It's believed the killer likely stalked him, setting fire to his couch that first night he was there, then murdering him the following evening. Using items in the first aid kit, the killer tied Chandler's feet with rope and his hands behind his back. Then he cut an electrical fan cord to use as a makeshift garret, hooking it to the binding holding Chandler's hands. With this setup, every movement Chandler made caused him to choke himself. Afterwards, the killer closed the window turned on the lights and began his work. He took surgical tape and began cutting it up. Each piece was placed on Chandler's face to make a mask that only left two small holes for the nostrils so he could breathe. 
After he was done making it, his final act was to stab Chandler using a small cork-handled knife from the kit. The killer then went to the bathroom, washed up, and packed up the first aid kit. He also took $70 from the victim's wallet, but police believe this was an afterthought. Although he took pains to bring his kit with him, he left behind the gruesome mask he expertly fashioned, likely to add to the shock factor. Since then, Chandler Steffen's killing has been dubbed as the Sarasota Mummy Murder. Police tried to pursue suspects and checked various angles, hoping to find some breakthrough on who might have killed the 22-year-old, but it was a dead end. Although the murder may have been premeditated, police believe Chandler was chosen at random and that a stranger killed him. Even after years of examination, no leads have been brought up. In 1988, the mask was sent to the FBI hoping forensics would find something new, but they concluded the killer may have worn gloves while handling the tape. To this day, the mummy murder is still an open cold case. Number 1. Jennifer Keese On January 24, 2006, 24-year-old Jennifer Keese prepared to go to work. She lived alone in her condo on Conroy Road in South Orlando. Every morning on her way to work, she called her boyfriend to wish him a good morning, but on this day, she never did and she didn't return his messages either. When Jennifer didn't show up for work, her co-workers informed her parents. Her family then made the two-hour drive from Tampa to her condo. Once there, they found signs she was around in the morning, and nothing seemed to miss except her car was gone and she was nowhere to be found. The family informed police, but initially they felt she might have just left on her own and would return. By 7 p.m., worried family members began distributing flyers with Keese's photo. Police then began taking the matter seriously, sending a detective to her condo unit and searching for her vehicle. Two days after her disappearance, on January 26th, a tenant in an apartment complex reported a vehicle matching her car. When surveillance was pulled up, it caught an unidentified stranger parking the car on the same day that she was reported missing. The camera took snapshots every three seconds and saw the person walk away from the vehicle, but each one of the photos had the stranger's face obscured by fencing. With no sign of forced entry, authorities believe Keese was abducted while she was on her way to work, and it was likely she was taken while walking to her vehicle. When police showed the images to her family and friends, they couldn't recognize the person in them. The image was also sent to the FBI and NASA to see if they could help out. NASA could only determine that the person was likely 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 5 in height. When a search dog was used to track the scent, the trail led from the car back to Keese's condo parking lot, meaning the stranger returned to the place where he or she likely abducted her. After examining her vehicle, the only thing obtained was a latent print and small DNA fiber. Some items missing were Keese's iPod, purse, briefcase, cell phone, and keys. Her bank account, however, has been left untouched since she disappeared. In hopes of finding a suspect, police interviewed several people close to her. This included her ex and current boyfriend, as well as a person in her former office that wanted to pursue a relationship with her. They were all cleared. Workers who were fixing up the condo building during the time were also questioned, but it proved impossible to pinpoint anyone. Some believe she may have been abducted and fell victim to a human trafficking ring, although there's no hard evidence pointing to this. Despite the case receiving national press and rewards being offered, she remained missing. The search was again conducted in 2014, and while there were leads, it still didn't yield answers. As of 2018, the Keese's family is asking the Orlando police to give them more information. They said authorities had largely withheld information from the family, outside of a two-page document. They are frustrated and hoping to conduct their own investigation. After 13 years, her family is still looking for answers as to what happened to Jennifer Keys. So there were four scary and weird mysteries from Florida. It may be known for beaches and sunshine, but it's undeniable Florida also has a very grim dark side. These cases still terrify and thousands more like it can be found in the good old Sunshine State. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday, so please remember to subscribe to our channel because you won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching, 
and we'll see you soon.